Hello and welcome. My name's Holly Tyrrell and I'm one of the directors at Transplant Australia. It is great to be with you tonight. I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional guard custodians of the land in which we each live and pay out my respects to the elders past and present. Transplant Australia has been working hard to help recipients and donors through this pandemic. Last year, we issued a series of videos to help recipients adjust to life in lockdown. And now, hopefully, as we look, for, look towards some light at the end of the tunnel, it is time to look at how coronavirus vaccination will help us all. So in a first for Transplant Australia, tonight's webinar has generated unprecedented interest with over 2,000 registrations. We've also been inundated with your questions and have aimed to tailor tonight's content to answer as many as possible. Please note tonight's webinar will be recorded and shared on the Transplant Australia website shortly following. I'd like to thank my fellow director, Professor Richard Allen for his inspiration in staging tonight, Maddie Hemstalk and Kim Rawson for their work behind the scenes and Estellas for continuing to support these initiatives. It has been great working so closely with the Transplantation Society of Australia and New Zealand, including the doctors, nurses, researchers and coordinators, as well as the Transplant Nurses Association. Professor Toby Coates is a good friend of Transplant Australia, the current president of TSANZ, physician and director of the Kidney Transplant Service at Royal Adelaide Hospital. So without further ado, I would like to hand over to Professor Coates to chair this evening's session. Thank you, Holly, and, and thanks everybody for uh, joining us uh, tonight for this. Um, it really is an absolutely fantastic thing that uh, Transplant Australia have put forward and the Transplant Society of Australia and New Zealand are very happy with the Transplant Nurses and uh, Transplant Australia to be able to present this to you. I thought I'd just start very quickly and give you a little bit of background just to let you know what's been happening behind the scenes um, for, uh, for the last year or so. Well, since the, the pandemic was declared, um, we have formed a task force between uh, the Transplant Society, TSA and Z, Donate Life, uh, who are the organ donor procurement uh, agency uh, and the transplant reference liaison group, TLRG, who are a group that work with the government to control uh, transplantation around the, around the country. The task force that we formed included, includes people who are experts uh, in infectious diseases, in experts in transplantation, experts, uh, expert nurses, expert tissue typers, all designed to try to come up with uh, the best possible solutions that we can during this very difficult time to keep transplantation happening. And I think it's important for you all to know that um, the people that work in Australia, um, we really have a group of first class uh, doctors, nurses, scientists, all of the people involved in transplantation are internationally well renowned and recognized. And we have good connections around the world. So we, we get the information that comes in very quickly and we're able to, I hope, pass it along to everybody as quickly as we possibly can. So I think we're in an enviable position in the world. We've got outstanding transplant services. We've got outstanding um, uh, transplant procedures uh, and we're able really to uh, deliver the optimal care for our patients uh, due to an excellent uh, government that, have, that has minimized the total number of infections that we've actually seen. So this is really now uh, an important point in, in where we are in handling this pandemic. Australia, all Australians, and particularly our transplant recipients, have done extraordinarily well. As, as Steve Chabam will show you, the total number of infections that we've had in our transplant positions, in transplant uh, patients, is remarkably small compared to the number of infections that we've had uh, in, in the country, which tells us immediately that transplant patients know what to do to stop getting this infection. Hand washing, um, social distancing, all of those things, they do very well. So the next phase of that then is how does the vaccine work to help us uh, protect the rest of the population going forward? And that's what tonight's webinar is all about. So we're really lucky to have two, uh, well, an expert panel um, uh, to, to discuss this. We've got Professor Steve Chadban from the uh, RPA Hospital uh, in Sydney, and we've got uh, Dr. Peter Bowen from Western Australia from uh, to talk more about the, the infectious diseases aspects and the clinical aspects. But to start off with, I'd like to uh, welcome uh, and introduce um, 
uh, Libby John, who's the president of the Transplant Nurses Association, to give you uh, a feel from the transplant nurses of exactly how things are likely to play out. So I'll hand over to, to, to Libby now. Thanks so much, Toby, and I'm really delighted to be here this evening representing the Transplant Nurses Association. Um, our group, the TNA, um, is an association for transplant nurses, transplant coordinators, who are often the first point of call for all our wonderful transplant recipients out there. And uh, often, you know, there's lots of questions uh, that we, we field for them. Um, and around the country, obviously, over the last at least 12 months we've been receiving lots of inquiries about COVID and more recently COVID vaccination and it's important that we can provide our recipients with um, consistent and uh, current and evidence-based information so this evening is really going to assist not only transplant recipients but health professionals like our transplant nurses to be able to provide um, the information to you. Um, I'd really like to thank Transplant Australia for the opportunity for us to be involved, but also for facilitating this really important session. Um, and I think it's going to be valuable to everybody. And I look forward to the presentations and the, the discussions about questions afterwards. So thanks again. And back to you, Toby. Thanks, Libby. So uh, we'll we'll crack on with it. Um, and what we're going to do uh, after the, the two presentations is we have a series of questions that you, uh, our audience, have sent in. In fact, the response has been quite extraordinary. And we've been able to group them into broadly three, three themes. Now, obviously, we can't answer specifics about people's individual situations. And those inquiries are always best addressed through your own, uh, your own doctors, your own transplant nurses, your own uh, units. But what we have been able to do is draw some common themes out and we'll get as many of those in as we possibly can. The other important thing to say is if we get questions coming through real time, what we're gonna to try to do is answer those afterwards and have those available on our websites. And as Holly said at the beginning, this is all being recorded. So you'll be able to share it with other people uh, through the um, Transplant Australia as well as come back and watch it again. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Peter Bowen. Um, he's an infection, infectious disease physician and microbiologist, an expert in COVID. He's been a member of our COVID-19 uh, National Transplant Task Force since the beginning, and he's absolutely the best person uh, to give us an overview uh, of the virus. So Peter, take it away, please. Okay, thanks, Toby. Um, uh, thanks for, for asking me to uh, help with this talk and I, I hope that you get something out of it and that we can answer some, uh, at least some of your questions. Um, the outline of this talk is to talk about the Australian COVID-19 vaccine rollout, to talk then about the COVID-19 vaccines with a focus on those that are in the Australian plan, their, their effectiveness, their side effects, and then some pragmatic issues, and then to talk also about uh, variants of concern. Just to start by way of introduction, this is a severe acute respiratory syndrome, coronavirus 2, which is the, the virus that causes COVID-19 infection and disease. And very simply, in the inside, in the coiled segment, that's where the, the genetic code of the virus is. Then there's a covering layer, an envelope, and very importantly on, on the surface of that is a glycoprotein, which is a protein with sugar elements. And this is called the spike glyco glycoprotein and is the target of um, of, of immunity from vaccination. Broadly speaking, there are three different types of coronavirus vaccines. And in the, in the top of this figure, uh, number one, you can see a spike protein. So it's actually creating a spike protein, purifying it, and then adding it to an adjuvant. An adjuvant is simply a, a substance which stimulates the immune system to this specific protein. So this is, uh, this is what the, the Novavax vaccine is an example of that. Going down to number two there in the middle row, you can see that uh, another approach is to, is to create a genetic code that actually creates spike protein. And this is put into an adenovirus vector, which is the hexagon shaped uh, red virus there. This is, this is uh, given by a vaccine. The adenovirus gets inside of human body cells. And in fact, they themselves uh, create the protein out of that genetic code. So the machinery of the, of the body cells does, does that work. And then that, that spike protein is presented inside the cells, but also on the surface and creates an immune response. The third type on the bottom is, so an example of that one is, is the, is the uh, AstraZeneca vaccine. 
The third type on the bottom is, is similar in the way that it works. It's an mRNA vaccine. That means messenger RNA. But really, this is, again, genetic code. And, and instead of what they, they, they cover this with a, a lipid uh, protection, and that vaccine is injected. This finds its way to cells. The lipid binds with the, um, and fuses with the cell membrane, human cell membranes. Again, the genetic code gets inside cells and the machinery of the cell actually makes the spike protein, again, inside the cells, on the surface of cells and stimulates the immune system. So this is typical of the Pfizer vaccine and Moderna vaccine. The Australian COVID-19 vaccine plan um, is uh, currently is, is a plan for 20 million doses of the Pfizer vaccine, 53.8 million doses of the AstraZeneca adenovirus vector vaccine, most of that manufactured in Victoria, then 51 million doses of Novavax, uh, which is a, a spike protein conjugated vaccine. And then there are some, some vaccines in a COVAX um, uh, international agreement. Um, what we know at the moment is that Pfizer has been, has been approved by the Therapeutic Goods Administration of Australia um, uh, several weeks ago. And um, the first doses have, have arrived. You would have seen in the news that 144,000 doses arrived the other day and are being uh, planned to be distributed. And uh, there's a plan for a, a first shipment is supposed to be about 800,000 doses total then with a plan for 3 million doses delivered between April and June and subsequent uh, supply thereafter. The AstraZeneca vaccine was approved by the Therapeutic Goods Administration of Australia yesterday and distribution is planned for um, to, to begin in March. Exact dates are uncertain. Novavax has not yet, is, is slower in, in its um, process and has not been presented to the TGA at, as, as yet. So in the Australian plan, there is, um, there is a prioritisation of vaccine to those who are more likely to be exposed to COVID-19 or more likely to be uh, affected severely if they get um, disease or get, get infected with the virus. So the first phase 1A, of up, which can be up to 1.4 million doses of vaccine, is to quarantine and border workers, frontline healthcare workers, um, those that live in age and uh, disability care and the staff of those uh, institutions. And you can see that uh, in 1B, there is uh, elderly um, individuals, other healthcare workers, but uh, people with underlying medical conditions. So that does include people who have had a transplant and people with chronic lung, kidney and heart disease. And then there are, are further phases um, through uh, that, that come later. You'll notice in phase three at the bottom that, uh, so at the moment, the, none of the vaccines have enough data in those under 16 years old. So um, children at the moment are not, uh, um, are not approved to be vaccinated, but that may come with time. There is more data coming uh, all the time. So there are some unanswered questions um, uh, about the actual vaccine rollout and the government hasn't, hasn't uh, spelled this out at the moment. So for example, will the Pfizer vaccine go to all of the early phase groups? Uh, or what I think is more likely, Pfizer will, will go to, to those as supply allows with concurrent use of AstraZeneca as that as the production of that ramps up. Where will individuals get their vaccine? At a hospital, uh, at a transplant unit, at a GP, at a pharmacy? That's also not exactly spelled out. What we do know is that initial supply of the Pfizer vaccine seems to be in certain uh, hubs, and um, th those are, 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 broadly speaking, around large hospitals, institutions. Um, how will individuals know when they're due for the vaccine? There is, there is planned to be some uh, notification of individuals when their time for vaccine uh, has come. So what we do know is that the Pfizer will first be the first uh, vaccine rolled out, and we've, we've seen that already this week, but the supply certainly will not be all at once. These 20 million doses will be uh, um, staggered throughout the year. AstraZeneca will be rolled out soon when available, and the, the plan is for, for a lot of that vaccine to be used. The Novavax approval and supply will certainly be later in time. I think it's unlikely that individuals will have a choice of vaccine. I think they'll be presented with a, a vaccine that, that, that's recommended to them on the basis of experts and the government opinion. And I think the reason for that is because the government has to have a whole of Australia approach looking at, at everyone's um, needs. And so I think they will, they will, um, they will control that decision. Uh, I, there is some evidence as well from the um, Therapeutic Goods Administration um, uh, documents about the AstraZeneca vaccine yesterday, that perhaps the Pfizer vaccine may be used in preference in those that are older or pregnant women because there's more data uh, for the Pfizer vaccine compared to AstraZeneca. But AstraZeneca may well uh, obtain that data soon enough to, to 
to be rolled out more to those groups. It's, AstraZeneca, I should say, is not going to be, um, it still can be used at any age, it's just that there seems to be more data in, um, uh, for Pfizer in, in older age groups. So moving on to the vaccines, you'll notice on the right there, I've got a little um, uh, reminder that this is an mRNA vaccine, that, um, that red coiled area on the right. So looking at eff uh, effectiveness, the, the, the main trial for this is a phase three trial. And really that means rather than looking at the immune responses to this vaccine, we're looking at how it actually prevents COVID infection. So they've did done these trials in areas where they had a fair bit of COVID going on in the community. So th this was a trial of 44,000 patients, who, people who were either randomized to get the vaccine or placebo. And the vaccine was two doses given 21 days apart. These were people that were 16 years or older and were generally healthy or had stable medical conditions. It was run predominantly in the United States, but also some other countries you can see there. Predominantly people were white, but uh, some mixtures of, of other ethnicities as well. And importantly, um, quite a lot of the, the participants were over 55, so 57%. And there were a significant proportion who were uh, obese and 20% with comorbidities. People who were immunocompromised or immunosuppressed were formally excluded. However, there were some people in the trial who received the vaccine who had conditions that, that, do, that do affect the immune system, though we suspect that, that these patients were had sort of inactive conditions. So, for example, the patients that had lymphoma or leukemia or who had a history of malignancy probably were, were, were history of those things without getting active treatment. But the details of that is not quite certain. In any case, this is a very effective vaccine and uh, COVID, the, the effectiveness was 95%. That's calculated by the, the number of COVID infections. This is symptomatic infections of eight in the vaccine group and 162 in the placebo group um, with pretty equivalent uh, numbers in each arms. Certainly does seem to protect against severe COVID as well. So only one case in the vaccine group and nine in the placebo cases. The way that they determined the effectiveness was to look at these infections more than seven days that occurred more than seven days after the second dose. Um, and they followed people for about two months after that second dose. So we have, we don't know exactly how, how long immunity and protection lasts, but we know in this trial, you know, at least two months. It seemed to be equally effective in those that had previously had COVID infection, who were older, who were obese and across ethnicities. And they, they noticed in the trial that the events of where people get COVID infection, uh, protection against that is reached actually about 14 days after the first dose. Um, but you certainly do need the second dose for boosting. The, the side effects were mostly not severe. They occurred mostly at day the, the day after vaccination, but sometimes day two and three, sometimes slightly later. And most of the, the uh, side effects lasted one to two days. They were less frequent in people that were older and um, there were more systemic reactions, at least in more frequently after the second dose. So to give you some idea of the percentages, local reactions, pain was experienced in 80%. That's not necessarily a surprise, but um, redness and swelling in 5% in or so, severe local reactions in less than 1%. Systemic reactions uh, were fatigue and headache are predominated, but again, these were, these were mild and short-lived uh, on the whole and fever, chills, muscle pains, joint pains, these things can occur commonly enough as well. Vomiting and diarrhea rates that you see there were the same actually in the placebo arm. Swollen lymph glands, which tend to be local lymph glands uh, near where the uh, vaccine was given in, in the deltoid muscle, uh, are uncommon. And as they've rolled this vaccine out into the United States in particular, um, and other places, they've looked at rates of severe infections called anaphylaxis is a, is a reaction that it occurs within 30 minutes, almost always after the vaccine. It's severe, it does need adrenaline. And it's, it's an important side effect, but it occurred at a very low rate of uh, five per million. You might have seen on the news uh, some time ago that in, as they rolled out the Pfizer vaccine in Norway, they had 30 um, people die uh, who were uh, in nursing homes, among about 20,000 people vaccinated in nursing homes. So they looked at this and actually the, the uh, governing bodies of, the, of Australia and the Europeans and North Americans, they did not show a link between uh, the deaths and vaccination. I mentioned here the Moderna vaccine uh, briefly. Uh, again, it's a, the same mRNA, vac mRNA vaccine uh, type. Um, uh, this is not currently planned for Australia's use, but it's just to show you that it's a very similar vaccine in its design and its efficacy. So similar sort of trial, more than 18 years old though, and about 30,000 participants, two, two doses, 28 days apart this time, rather than 21. 
This was run in the United States. And again, quite a few a percentage of the participants were, were over 65 years old and predominantly white. Again, some comorbidities of interest um, uh, that can affect the immune system to some degree in the vaccine arm. And effectiveness was, was very similar and looked at at a very similar time, uh, COVID infection occurring more than 14 days after the second dose. This also affects um, it, uh, against, is protective against uh, severe COVID infection. You can see there's zero cases in the, in the vaccine arm versus 30 in the placebo arm. And they had a, a look at asymptomatic infection as well. That's people without any symptoms, but who, who end up having a positive PCR. It's less effective against that, that subset, but still re retains some activity. And adverse effects are similar to the Pfizer vaccine and a low rate of anaphylaxis. So Astra AstraZeneca vaccine is the other main vaccine in the Australian landscape. And as this is an adenovirus vector vaccine, as we talked about. Um, so the phase three trial, again, looking at clinical effectiveness of this at preventing COVID-19 was of about 11,000 participants in the United Kingdom and Brazil. And this was given at a variable interval of two doses, uh, four to 12 weeks apart. Now, the, the majority of people, individuals in this trial were younger. They were aged 18 to 55 with only, um, uh, what's that, 12% 12 over 55 years old. So that's, that's important. And there was a major recruitment of healthcare workers, which made up roughly um, uh, almost 90% of the, of the uh, participants. So they may be um, uh, a little bit healthier sometimes. The effectiveness was 70% overall at, at, at preventing symptomatic COVID. And curiously, those that got a, a lower dose for the first dose, uh, the effectiveness seemed to be um, higher for reasons that are not exactly clear. In a separate report, they did, again, look at these two, um, for, for two standard doses, they looked at whether an interval, uh, the intervals made any difference. So the effectiveness was a bit higher, it seemed, for those that had an interval of vaccines of 12 weeks compared to those where the interval was less than six weeks, 81% versus 55%. Like the other vaccines, they've shown that the effectiveness starts actually a few weeks after you have the first dose. But like the others, you do need the booster dose. They did look at asymptomatic infection in this, uh, in this trial and um, less effective than it was against symptomatic COVID, similar to the other trials, but, but still some effectiveness nonetheless. Importantly, all the, um, uh, so severe COVID was all in the placebo arm. So 10 patients that went to hospital with COVID, two that had severe uh, infections such as in the ICU and one death, they're all in the placebo arm. Adverse effects are quite similar to the uh, to uh, the Pfizer vaccine and Moderna vaccine. Most are not severe, mostly early after the vaccine and lasting just a few days. Again, they're less frequent in older people, uh, but in this case, uh, more frequent with the first dose. So local reactions like pain in about 45%, redness and swelling in a, in a low percentage, uh, really of two to 4%. And systemic reactions like the other vaccine, fatigue, a headache, feverish, uh, muscle aches and nausea. So finally, um, the Novavax vaccine is the other uh, more, more later vaccine. This is a, as we said, it's a protein with an adjuvant uh, called a saponin adjuvant. Trials of this are being run in the United Kingdom and South Africa, and they're not actually formally reported yet, but a media release from the company uh, some time ago suggested that the effectiveness was 89%. Uh, in, in, in the trial in the UK, about 15,000 participants who were given two doses of the vaccine 21 days apart. Significant percentage were over 65 years old. And actually there were, there were two, not, not enough severe COVID cases to really comment on the effectiveness of that particular type of COVID or subset of COVID. Certainly the effectiveness against the UK variant, which is also called B.1.1.7, uh, was a little bit less than um, the non-UK variant. Um, another, so the, the other trial has been run in South Africa, and um, so the effectiveness there was, was lower. It was 60%. This is a trial of about 4,400 uh, participants. 93% um, of the cases of infection were due to the, the South African variant, which is very dominant in South Africa. Um, severe COVID, again, uh, too, it's too difficult to say whether it protects against uh, severe COVID based on those very small numbers. In the small numbers of patients that are participants that were HIV positive, the effectiveness looked uh, a little less, but again, this is a small number. The company says that there's, there's serious side effects are uncommon and balanced between vaccine and placebo arms, but we haven't actually seen the trial data. Moving on to um, some, some sort of practical issues. 
We know most about the Pfizer vaccine because we th this information has, has come to the Australian uh, Therapeutic Goods Administration and they've given all their detailed information about the vaccine. So issues, um, uh, issues about or you know uh, pragmatics of the AstraZeneca vaccine will be coming through shortly in the um, in, in the government literature. So this this uh, Pfizer vaccine needs to be stored at very cold storage, minus seventy degrees, and and those storage like that's not always uh, is a bit hard to come by. Um, the AstraZeneca and Novavax vaccines can be put in, in refrigerator storage, two to eight degrees. So this is more uh, easy for pharmacies and GPs, for example. The Pfizer vaccine, once it comes out of minus 70 storage, is stable in the refrigerator for five days. And it, after it's diluted in saline to, to be made up into doses, it's stable at room temperature for six hours. Um, although it's meant to be uh, 21 days apart, it can be delayed up to six weeks. That's acceptable uh, in between doses. Vaccine should be given to those with prior infection and antibody testing is not required to confirm um, a prior infection. Antibody testing after the vaccine is not currently recommended, but this is an, an area of active uh, research and, and some debate. The issue really is, does antibody testing, is that a good surrogate? Is that a good test to say whether the vaccine is going to be effective at preventing infection? And um, it may not be, um, but further research is going to that area. Other vaccines, in particular inf influenza, which is um, obviously going to be rolled out at a similar time to the COVID vaccine with uh, winter coming up, should be avoided within 14 days of the COVID-19 vaccine. But um, if somehow there's, they're just trying to avoid um, uh, giving both vaccines where uh, if you had an adverse effect, effect it may not be, uh, it may be difficult to tell which of the vaccines caused the problem. Um, but there's not, there's not any suspicion that the vaccines will interfere with their, their effect or cause more side effects or anything in particular. So if they are given within uh, closer together, that's, that's fine. Until there's further, further uh, data, there is a trial of the Pfizer vaccine of age 12 to 15 that they're, they're running now that should be out in a few months, the results. For now, it's limited to those who are 16 years or older. It's considered safe for breastfeeding, the Pfizer vaccine, and it can be considered for, for pregnant women. Animal studies that have been done show no signal for, for problems in the fetus, and the limited number of pregnant people who have been given the vaccine have, have done so without, uh, without issues. The only contraindications or reasons you can't have this vaccine is if you have the vaccine and you get anaphylaxis or some very severe immediate allergy to the, to the vaccine. The only other thing is that there's, there's a substance in the vaccine called polyethylene glycol and it's very rare to have anaphylaxis to, to this uh, substance. The number of reported cases in, in the world is, is, is roughly 40 or so. So you don't need to be concerned about that. Um, if people are on anticoagulants, then it's, it's thought that with an intramuscular vaccine rather than a subcutaneous vaccine, uh, that excess bleeding, if pressure is put on, on the area, uh, shouldn't be a big problem. But the, it's recommended if your INR, if you're on warfarin and your INR is more than three, that you might delay vaccination. And if you're on a uh, low molecular weight heparin, heparin, also called clexane sometimes, that if, you're, if the effectiveness of that is high, then you might again delay uh, vaccination. Further details about other anticoagulants and bleeding conditions are, are pending. So moving finally on to um, uh, uh, the variants, the COVID-19 variants and vaccine responses. In the top of this figure, you can see um, uh, on the left-hand side, the virus in the, in the uh, orange, the spike protein you can see interacts with the host cell through this, uh, what's called an ACE2 receptor on the host cell. And in particular, there's a, there's a part of the spike protein called the receptor binding domain, which is very important at this binding. On, on the right of that figure, you can see that antibody, which is that uh, Y-shaped yellow sub, um, uh, sort of uh, figure, that is the receptor binding domain is an important area uh, for binding and to prevent interaction with the host cell and infection of the cell. So in the bottom of this figure where you've got the variants, um, there's three main variants um, that have uh, derived from the, 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 um, the parent virus. So you can see the UK um, United Kingdom virus, um, the one in South Africa and one in Brazil. So I wouldn't worry about the characteristic number of mutations, but on that third column where it talks about mutations in the S gene, the spike, spike gene, receptor binding domain, you can see that there's some common mutations across them, but particularly um, one called E484K seems to be uh, something that can evade the antibodies produced by vaccine and produced by infection. So there's also some suggestion that the, these mutations 
allow stronger binding to the ACE2 receptor and, and sort of, if you like, more infection of cells, so which relates to being more efficient to be transmitted. So what do we know about these vaccines with these various, uh, with these variants of concern? For the Pfizer and Moderna mRNA vaccines, actually what we know is that antibodies from, from people that have had the vaccine uh, are somewhat less active against the UK variant and seem to be, and more, um, well, less active, shall we say, against the South African uh, variant in laboratory tests. But actually these, these, these um, vaccines have not looked at uh, prevention of COVID uh, for, these for these strains uh, in a clinical setting. The AstraZeneca uh, vaccine, on the other hand, has actually had done trials in these countries where these are circulating. And so we know that uh, the vaccine effectiveness is a little bit less for the UK variant compared to not. And we know that in a small trial in South Africa, as you will have seen in the media, the vaccine effectiveness seems to be about 10%. I will qualify this and say that you can see that the number of events in those arms is not high. So there's about 20 events in the vaccine and placebo arm you know, that's compared to, you remember in, in some of the other trials, we're talking about hundreds of events. And certainly for severe, severe cases, which is what we most want to prevent, uh, there, are, there are no cases in vaccine or placebo arm in that small trial. So this doesn't, this, we're unsure if this does or doesn't uh, um, prevent severe uh, infection with this variant. The Novavax vaccine has lower effectiveness against the UK strain and, and, and much well, somewhat uh, more lower against the South African variant. At the moment, there's no good data through yet for the um, vaccine effectiveness against the Brazilian strain. So to sum up, um, the COVID-19 vaccines uh, for use in Australia, that none of them are, are live vaccines. Um, their eff effectiveness ranges between uh, 70 to 95%, uh, but the duration of um, effectiveness is uncertain at this stage. That's the, um, the subject of ongoing trials. All these trials are ongoing. The effectiveness is lower in particular for the South African variant um, and uh, local and systemic um, side effects are common, but generally mild and short lived. I'll hand back to you, Toby. Great, thanks very much. Um, that's uh, terrific, Peter. Um, I've been watching uh, all of the comments come across the chat and it, look, it is very difficult. We, uh, we've deliberately tried to give as much information as we possibly can. And that's because we don't want to dumb down anything for everybody. Um, the whole webinar is gonna be on the internet. And so you should then be able to uh, come back and have a look at it. Uh, at, at your leisure and pick out any bits that you're particularly uh, focused on. And Holly's gonna give a good summary at the end of, of the main clinical, clinical points and the things that, we, things that we think are relevant. So I'm gonna move on now then um, to introduce Professor Steve Chadban. Um, he is a past president of the Transplant Society and he's the co-chair with me of the TLRG uh, COVID vaccine rapid response or COVID-19 rapid response that we put forward over the last 12 months or so. So Steve, uh, please take it away and tell us uh, from your point of view more about uh, vaccination and the transplant recipients. Toby, thanks very much for the kind introduction. I'd like to kick off by talking about what this disease is doing to the rest of the world, because I think that's really important in thinking about how we approach immunization as Australians. The data here shows that currently there are 45 million active cases that we know about worldwide, a similar number of had COVID and recovered. But that's come at the cost of 2.3 million deaths nationally. The map here shows the countries that have had the highest impact in red, they're pretty much everywhere we wanna go, US, Europe, our, our neighbors in Asia. The only colors that are not like that are other countries that can't afford to do enough testing. So we're really not quite sure about how much COVID there is or it's Australia and New Zealand, and we're very much the lucky ones. Peter's given us a beautiful discussion um, about the details of the vaccines. I'm not going to do that. What I'm going to focus on is why is COVID-19 a particular problem for transplant recipients for you guys? I want to think about what are my chances of catching COVID-19 in Australia as a transplant recipient? And what are my chances of getting very sick if I get it? Secondly, I wanna look at the evidence for COVID-19 vaccination for transplant patients specifically. Will they work and are they safe? And here I warn you that the data is small, it's relatively uncertain, but I'll show you what we can get. 
I want to cover some important points such as will it work? Will it be safe? Is this likely to damage my transplant? And are there some other benefits for travel, for work and other reasons? And finally, I want to sum up with what I think you should do when it comes to vaccination. So firstly, do we need to worry about this virus as transplant recipients? And the first data we got that suggested that is the case is like this. This is a very small report from New York at the height of their peak early last year, where they found that 36 consecutive kidney transplant recipients presented to Montefiore Hospital with COVID-19. There are a mix of ethnicities and a variety of ages. Most were on to Crolimus, mycophenolate and prednisolone, as are many of you. They found that presenting features were really very similar to the general community, maybe a little less actually, except that everybody that was admitted to hospital had evidence of pneumonia on their chest X-ray. What really worried us as clinicians was that 10 out of the 36 patients succumbed to COVID-19, 28%. A similar number also lost the function of their kidney. So we were really worried. At the same time, we saw preliminary report reports come in from London, Spain, and Italy telling us much the same thing. This was a terrible virus to get if you were a transplant recipient. And this very much influenced our thinking and our response in Australia. Shortly after receiving these reports, as Toby mentioned earlier, the TSANZ joined forces with the Australian government through the Organ and Tissue Authority and formed the Transplantation and Donation of COVID-19 Rapid Response Task Force, consisted of a handful of leading clinicians in transplantation, also donation specialists, um, infectious diseases experts, including Peter, and a really good data analyst. And we got together weekly and we produced uh, communiques telling our thoughts to the government, to transplanters and to patients every week. And this paper that we published recently pretty much summarizes what happened. We found that in Australia during our initial peak, we saw a surge in cases as shown in the graph on the right. Um, looking at all the international consequences of COVID, we elected to stop living donor kidney transplantation and reduce much of deceased donor kidney transplantation and transplantation of other organs on the 24th of March. As Australia rapidly got on top of our situation, we were able to restart again on the 27th of April. But the impacts were significant. We found looking back a year later that transplantation rates had actually fallen by about 30% in our country, despite having very little COVID after this peak. In fact, that was very similar to the reductions in the number of transplants uh, that were performed and the number of organ donors that went through also in heavily impacted countries like the United States, Spain, France, and the United Kingdom. So interestingly, from a transplant perspective, we were just as heavily impacted, at least in doing less transplants. And that came at a significant price to many people. And here we have some data that was uh, collated by some experts in research, particularly Alison Tong, by some patients in this area. And here I'd like to flag Nikki Scholes Robertson together with a, a group of transplanters where we formed patient discussion groups between kidney transplant candidates, people waiting for a transplant when we stop transplantation, their caregivers and potential donors, and we sought to feel their perspectives. The themes that emerged were, were quite troubling. We disappointed people, people were devastated with their plans being suspended, particularly if they were booked in to have a living donor transplant. Some people felt helpless and vulnerable. Others felt stressed through the uncertainty. When will transplant begin? When can that light at the end of the tunnel re-emerge for me? Many felt the exacerbating burdens, not only of their kidney condition or their other organ failure condition, but also their threat of COVID on top of that. And others were troubled about how do I sustain my health during this tough time? But happily people got through. Now that we're about nine months on from that, the picture that's emerging about how COVID-19 impacts kidney transplant recipients and other organ transplant recipients globally is becoming much firmer with better data like this. This is from Paris. It involves about 1,200 patients, very similar to our Australian patients. 
here, patients were included um, on the 1st of March, 2020, and followed and enrolled through to about the 30th of April in the same year. And people were screened in the clinic and by telephone. And the aim of the exercise here was to see what proportion of transplant recipients in these centres developed COVID and what became of them. And the bottom line is that 5% of kidney transplant recipients here in Paris became infected compared to about 0.3% of the French general population, suggesting that transplant patients may be more likely to get infected. Of more concern, however, 24% of kidney transplant patients who did develop COVID-19 died from that, which is a rate of about six to 10 times higher than the general population, really confirming this, the concerns we'd had following the early reports. Factors such as being non-white, being obese, having diabetes, or particularly having chronic lung disease did increase the risks of COVID and severe COVID. So I think these are important messages for us. In Australia, we're fortunate to have the ANS data registry where we capture the outcomes of all of our patients on dialysis and uh, who receive a kidney transplant. And here we sought to capture how did COVID-19 impact our patients? And this is the data. As Toby alluded to earlier on, we have over 12,000 Australians who are living with a kidney transplant. 21 of those that we're aware of developed COVID. They've all either recovered or two people have succumbed to the disease. Both of those people were over the age of 70 and had other comorbidities like diabetes that predisposed to severe disease. The story in our, among our dialysis population of over 13,000 patients is really quite troubling. Whilst only 13 people acquired COVID, seven of those died from it. So COVID-19 is rare among our Australian transplant population, which is great, but it does have a significant impact when it occurs. We don't want that. So what then of vaccination and can it improve the prospects for for us as, as kidney transplant patients. This um, is one of the large studies that Peter alluded to. And the reason I show it is because I want to get a sense of how the immunizations impact the general population. And I'll then compare it to the data that we have for transplanted populations. Here, this was a massive US multi-center center study. 80% of participants were white. Again, it was a messenger RNA virus as Peter described earlier. Patients here were an average of 51 years, um, although 25% of them were over 65. A small proportion had underlying lung, heart disease, diabetes, or obesity, and a very small number had HIV. Here, patients received two doses of vaccine compared to a group who received two doses of placebo. And the vast majority of people went through the whole trial, which is tremendous. Patients were monitored for side effects, local and systemic, and for development of COVID-19. And I'll show you this data just to give you a feel for some trends. Peter's already mentioned what can happen in terms of local side effects from the vaccines. Here, this data confirms that they are quite common. Over 50% of people had pain. Um, a smaller number had redness or swelling. And note that it's more common to occur after the second dose. Systemic features are probably more common, as Peter said, often happening a day or two later. And here you can see that more than 50% of people developed headache, fatigue, some muscle aches, um, or um, sometimes chills and fever. Once again, note that it's more common to occur after the second dose. I should say most of these were self-limiting and relatively mild. But man, did it work. This graph shows you now in the gray bar, those who received placebo progressively developed COVID-19, symptomatic in this instance, compared to very little development of disease among those who received the, the um, true vaccine is shown in blue. And you can see that the benefits occurred even before the second dose was given with the two lines separating quite ni nicely. So among the general population, the vaccines are quite well tolerated. They have recognized side effects and they work. So what data do we have for you guys, for transplant recipients? And the honest answer is very little as yet. 
this data comes courtesy of Jeremy Chapman, who's the editor of Transplantation and made this available to us. It only came out today. This is a study from Johns Hopkins of only 187 organ transplant recipients from across the US. Um, it's, uh, they all received the mRNA COVID-19 vaccines. The average age was around 50 and the majority of these people were healthcare workers, most commonly female and white. About half had had a kidney transplant and then a smattering of liver, heart, lung and multi-organ re recipients. On average, these people were six years post-transplant, but ranging from a couple of years to um, 13 years post-transplant. The majority were on tacrolimus, mycophenolate, and prednisolone, just as we are. Interestingly here, patients were recruited via social media or through um, flyers at the transplant center, which is probably why we got so many healthcare workers. And all participants completed an online questionnaire one week after the first dose. And the data I have for you today purely relates to that first dose. The results showed that no patients reported cases of COVID-19 symptoms in the first week after vaccination, not surprising with such a small trial. There were no reported cases of acute rejection or problems with, with the transplant organ. There were no new neurological diagnoses such as MS type symptoms or other other features that have been linked to vaccines in the past. Um, and there was no treatment for allergic reactions. Local reactions of mild pain, mild redness, and mild swelling were completely consistent with those for the general population, as were the frequency and severity of systemic reactions, such as fevers and chills, fatigue, headaches, and myalgia. Maybe a little less than the general population, but do remember that this is just after the first dose and, and side effects tend to be a little more common after the second. So the conclusions here, I think, are that the mRNA, mRNA vaccine is safe for organ transplant recipients and the side effects are similar to the general population and they carry no risk to the organ. And I'll flag that because there may be some patients who have specific underlying conditions that may be triggered by vaccination. Those are incredibly rare. Um, uh, AHUS is probably the main condition to be concerned about. The vast majority of people do not have that. So we believe the, that the vaccine poses no risk to damaging your organ. But the caution here is this is a small study and it's very early data. So are we willing to be vaccinated? This is an interesting data, not from the medical journal, but from the economist and it summarize the number of surveys that were conducted of various populations around the world, including Australia in August last year, and then resurveyed in January this year. And what it shows is that around the globe, there's a variety of appetites for immunization. Interestingly, up near the highest of Britain, who have seen the worst consequences of COVID-19 and have a massive immunization that's very successfully underway. And interestingly, since that can campaign was initiated, Britons have become more willing to accept the vaccine. I think we should look at that. This is to reinforce the need that Australians need to be immunised. I remind you that 103 million people around the world have had this virus that we know of. In Australia, it's only 29,000, a tiny number. But when you look at the rest of the world, we can't stay um, quarantine from them forever, we will come into contact and we will get this virus at some stage. And it's deadly. Remember that worldwide we've seen 2.3 million deaths in Australia, only 900, but we will be exposed to this risk again in the near future. One of the reasons we will be exposed is this. This looks at, uh, again from The Economist, looks at world, um, world travel by passenger numbers over the past 40 or 50 years or so, what you can see is that major world events in the past have impacted this very modestly. The Gulf War, September 11, the global financial crisis. But then COVID-19 dwarfs every other impact. It's crashed global travel, but that won't be forever. People will want to travel, people are starting to travel in the rest of the world, and people will once again come to Australia and bring this virus. We need to be immunized. So in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, before we move to question and answers, 
I would argue that COVID-19 is a big potential problem for Australian transplant recipients. Transplant recipients appear to be more likely to get infected, more likely to get sick, and more likely to die from this virus than the general population. The low prevalence of COVID in Australia is fantastic, but there is every probability that it will return in waves in future, and we need to be prepared for it. COVID-19 vaccines work well as far as we can tell. We're not sure for how long nor how well they prevent infection and transmission, but they really do prevent severe outcomes of COVID and death. They are protective against the variants, as Peter has shown you. We do need more data. We may need mod modifications. COVID-19 vaccines for transplant patients, um, will they work and are they safe? And the answer is likely to be yes. The early evidence suggests that they're safe and effective Unquestioningly, we need more data, but that will take time. They have similar side effects to the general population. We don't believe they can damage your transplant, and there are likely to be other benefits, including travel globally. So what should you do when it comes to vaccination? Get immunized. Be prepared to potentially need re-immunization as vaccines are improved over time, but do get immunized. Understand that mild side effects are common and manageable. And keep up to date. We'll endeavour to help you keep up to date, but keep your eyes out for new data as it arises. I'd like to close there, Toby, and hand over to questions. Great. Uh, thanks, Steve, for that uh, fantastic uh, overview of what's uh, what's happening. Uh, again, I've been watching the what's coming through on the chat line just to reassure everybody that this will be recorded, or it is being recorded, and you'll be able to have a good look at it. But clearly, it's very hard for us to answer the questions in real time that people are putting forward. So we're going to do our very best to get those answers up onto the website within the next 24 hours or so, uh, based on, on, on the number of questions that we have. We did have a really fantastic response from uh, our consumers uh, uh, asking us questions before uh, the webinar. Uh, and we've got a, quite a few of those to go through now. So I'm glad we've got some time to be able to do it. And, and Steve, uh, Libby uh, and Peter are going to be able to answer to the best of their ability the questions that we have. So I'm going to start uh, off um, this again. These are questions that we've grouped from what we what was sent in before the uh, before the, the webinar and they're grouped into really safety, timing and then resuming normality. So the first question I've got from our audience, um, which is regarding safety, I'm going to address to Peter to start off with. Uh, and the question was, which vaccine will be best for transplant recipients, Peter? Could you uh, address that for us, please? Yeah, sure. So um, what we know in, in the, broadly speaking, in the general population, the vaccines uh, look effective against severe COVID, and that's the most important thing. They, they do have, um, uh, like a lot of vaccines, the, the effectiveness against milder forms of illness is not is not always quite as good, and certainly against asymptomatic forms of, of the infection, uh, often not quite as good again. We don't have uh, data, as Steve said, specifically in transplant patients to be able to say which is most effective, um, and that data will certainly come because this, these vaccines are being rolled out not only in Australia, of course, but broadly throughout the world. So we expect that that to come in and, and help help our decision making. I think at the moment we can't actually say um, uh, which which is which vaccine is better for, for, for transplant uh, patients or for candidates. And I think what we also need to keep in mind is that um, the Australian government does have, uh, like we've got sort of transplantation and infection experts here, they have a very um, expansive immunisation and vaccine um, experts. And, and, and th those um, experts also have a lot of experience with immunocompromised patients. And they, they are looking at the data as it comes through all the time and making decisions about just, just that question, you know, is, is one preferred for a certain group, say elderly people, pregnant women or transplant recipients, they're looking at those kinds of issues all the time. I think, um, I think what, I would, what I would sort of uh, advise is that when the opportunity comes to be vaccinated, as I said, I'm, I, 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 don't, I don't think there'll be actually a, a choice for individuals. And I'd advise you to take the one that, um, that is available to you at the time. That's, that's great. That's great. Thanks, uh, Peter. I'll follow that up for a very quick one because uh, it's come through on the chat lines as well. Um, is there a difference for the different transplant types? 
Are we able to say that at this point in time or is it too early uh, to say? We, we don't, uh, as, as I said, don't have uh, data in transplants generally. We don't actually have a lot of data in, in more broadly immunocompromised or immunosuppressed people. Um, and so, but look, I, I would predict that the, the common thing with um, people who have a solid organ transplant is the immunosuppression. And although there's varying degrees based on um, the type of transplant, the kind of drugs that are used are very similar. I don't expect that they'll that, that we'll find that uh, a certain vaccine is preferenced for a particular transplant type. I think it, and it, yeah. So I think I don't think I don't think it'll be different for a, a different transplants. Fantastic, thanks, Pete. Uh, I'll turn now to ask the next next question to Steve Chadban. So, Steve, um, a question that came through: uh, Can I lose my transplant or face rejection by taking the vaccine? And if the vaccine creates more antibodies, will this impact or have an effect on the transplant? Steve, what do you think? Toby, I think that's the question that's on everybody's mind. Um, we do not believe that the vaccines that Peter's discussed today will cause rejection of any type of organ. Um, we, we have some minor concerns only in one real condition and, and that's atypical hemolytic uremic syndrome where flu vaccines have on occasion in the past triggered that disease, which has then damaged the kidney. It hasn't caused rejection. Um, the antibodies that are generated by the vaccines are very specific for the virus. They only target the virus. They won't touch your kidney or your heart or your lung transplant. So I think we can reassure, reassure people about that. Fantastic. Thanks, Steve. Um, I've got another question I'd like this time to address to Libby. Uh, from the transplant nurses. Uh, Libby, um, we've been asked by, our, by the audience, should everyone in my household be vaccinated? What's your take on that? A uh, short answer is yes. Um, obviously, if close contacts um, have been vaccinated, it reduces the risk of infection. Um, however, I don't think at this stage there will, I think for the the vaccine will still have to be rolled out in phases and people will get vaccination according to where they fit into those phases would be my understanding but certainly would recommend close contacts get vaccinated definitely um, to, to reduce the risk of infection to a transplant recipient. I guess the other situation that worries all of us are the kids and, and particularly transplant recipients who've got young young children. I, I don't know whether Peter or, or, or Libby or Steve want to jump in there. What do we think about the situation for kids at this point? So none of the vaccines are, are, are licensed at the moment for um, people younger than 16 years old. But as I said, I think that, that, that data will come through soon because those trials for AstraZeneca and for Pfizer and other vaccines are being run as we speak in, in, in younger people. So look, as we go through this period this year, I suppose, and then, then this sort of um, uh, the use in, 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 in paediatrics will be updated and that will, the, the, the companies will approach the Therapeutic Goods Administration of Australia to update uh, their licence to allow use in children. I think at the moment, a couple of things to stress are that um, children don't seem to be uh, infected with COVID quite as commonly and neither do they get um, such severe illness. Even, look, there are um, obviously children that have underlying uh, immunosuppressing um, conditions. It's been looked at, for example, in um, children with haematological cancers and who've had bone marrow transplants and those kinds of things. They do have a higher rate of, of complications than, than other children, but they're not reaching the sort of uh, levels that we see with adults and certainly with the sort of elderly people. So. I think what we can do for the moment is, is as Libby was describing, try to, uh, when the opportunity comes to vaccinate the, the family members um, around the, the, the child, um, the, the vulnerable child, that's what we can do for the moment. And when the approval comes through for children to be vaccinated, they can take that opportunity. Thanks, thanks, Pete, that's a great answer. Um, there are lots of good questions and I'd like to address the next one that, that we had to Steve Chatban because I think it's one again that all of our transplant recipients will be thinking about. Uh, and that is, do we have any evidence that the vaccination's going to affect the transplant medications or the drugs that all of our patients are taking 
uh, to keep those beautiful, valuable organs working so well. Is there any signal that we've seen around the world from all the people who have been vaccinated yet, Steve? What's your thoughts? I'm really glad that, that everybody's thinking about that because we stress that point. From vaccines, that is not an issue. We do not believe vaccines will interfere with any of your immunosuppressant medications. The other way around, we think we have some concerns that your immunosuppression may reduce the effectiveness of the vaccines by a little bit, but that should not put us off from vaccinating you. That's, that's great. And just following on, uh, just to reinforce from your previous presentation, Steve, um, what evidence do we have that the vaccine's safe in the transplant population? Can you just make that point again? Because that's something that people are concerned about. Yeah, so, so I think the first trial we've seen, I talked of, it's a little under 200 people, Toby. Um, it, it's um, a broad spectrum of general society dominated by healthcare workers, I think would be good at reporting back any symptoms they develop. And reassuringly, after the first dose of an mRNA vaccine, they got a very similar profile of side effects to the general community with no severe side effects and no transplant organ dysfunction. It's only after the first dose, love to see the data after the second dose. We will see that, but it'll be a few months down the track. And you can, the audience can take a commitment from, from us and Transplant Australia that we'll be getting this information out to all of you as soon as we have it. Uh, we're, as I mentioned before, we're very well connected with these people through Professor Jeremy Chapman, Professor Chad Ban here. So when we hear a signal, we hear it early and we'll be passing it on to you all. I just want to ask, turn to Libby now, uh, because of course it's it's not just, of course it's not just transplant recipients we're worried about. We're all worried about all Australians uh, with this infection, but also, you know, transplantation really does depend upon living donors as well, particularly for the kidney. So Libby, what advice do we have for our living donors, particularly over the age of 60? Would you like to just quickly comment on that for people in the audience? Um, sorry, Toby, you did break up a bit when you were asking that question, but you're asking about um, yeah, living donors, donors over yeah. the age of 60. Um, so, yes, we recommend that uh, vaccination. Um, uh, those particular group of, of people, though, obviously people who are very well, they're, they're fit, healthy people who have um, fit the criteria to be live donors. So we wouldn't expect that be, a, that'd be a low risk, which I should say, for severe COVID infection, but um, they should get vaccination uh, as, as it's rolled out in the phases, but we would consider that probably be a lower risk, certainly than, than a transplant recipient in terms of a severe COVID infection. Thanks, Libby. Another excellent question that we've had come through, uh, which I'll address now to Peter, is um, will vaccination stop me from getting infected or reduce the severity of the illness, i.e. I won't need to be hospitalised? What do you think vaccination will do? Will that prevent people from being, becoming sicker or how do, you, how do you think it will play out, Peter? So all of the vaccines have, have um, in, in a general sense, have enough um, events of severe COVID to be able to say that uh, it's protective uh, against that in the general population. And that's, that's, that's the most important thing we want to prevent is, is making people getting very sick with this virus. Um, some of them, the vaccine, vaccine trials that are a little bit uh, slower to come through uh, have less of those events like uh, Novavax, I think. Um, but the, the data in transplant recipients or candidates is not expected to be different. We expect that it should, um, again, prevent against severe COVID. We don't, we don't know that for certain at the moment because as, as Steve said, we don't have that specific data, but that will come through. So we expect that it will. Um, will it prevent you getting infection? Well, um, what we know is that in, again, in the general population, that there is some, some effectiveness against that ranging from roughly 70 to 95%. But what we, what we know about is really, is unfortunately at the moment, um, short-term protection. So for a couple of months, and as, as time goes on and the people in those trials get, get further and further follow up, we'll have some further idea how long that uh, the protection lasts from the vaccine. Um, and so uh, we expect, again, we expect the same sorts of outcomes in uh, roughly speaking in transplant candidates and, and, and uh, recipients, but that specific data we're gonna have to wait for and um, yes. Great, thanks, thanks Pete. Lots of other really good questions. I'm sorry that we, we, we have a number that we can get through and we will, as I say, try to do the others uh, 
uh, in the next 24 hours or so. Uh, but this is a really good one because both Steve and I uh, are involved, uh, and Libby obviously very much so, um, with patients who are on the waiting list. Um, and the question has come through saying, well, what about those waiting for a transplant or on dialysis? What's our experience uh, with vaccination there? I'll, I'll flick that one to Steve, I think, uh, for a comment. Steve, can you tell us what you think about that? feel very strongly that we should immunise everybody who's on the waiting list, but also everybody with organ failure. All such people will fall into the government strata 1B, which means that just after frontline healthcare workers, people with organ failure are um, enabled to get a vaccine. And I think we should all accept it because as the Australian data has shown and the international data has shown, People on dialysis experience very high rates of mortality from COVID. We want to prevent that. It's likely to be the same for people with other types of organ failure also, Toby. Thanks, Steve. Libby, um, another good question, this in terms about uh, timing of other vaccinations that's come through. Um, would you like to comment about, can I take the vaccine at the same time as my flu shot? Because of course, we're going into winter and we'll have flu coming onto us as well. Could you give us your thoughts and what you think we should be doing there? Thanks, Libby. Yeah, well, the recommendation is that you should wait for at least 14 days um, after the COVID vaccination before having your flu and, um, vaccination or wait for 14 days after your flu vaccination before you have the COVID vaccination. Um, there's not a lot of evidence available about um, the efficacy of the vaccines if you have two vaccines together or any um, interactions. So the recommendation is um, 14 days between courses of vaccinations. Thanks, Libby. Um, I'll go back to you, Steve, just quickly. Um, and this is a good question uh, from the audience again. Um, will I need proof of vaccination to remain on the transplant waiting list? No, we won't require that. We will strongly encourage everybody to be vaccinated. We won't require proof to show that you've done so. Thanks, Steve. Um, Peter, uh, here's another one for the vaccinologists. Good question here. How will I be notified that my turn has come up and where will I go to to get my vaccination? Very good question. Um, some of those details haven't really uh, been fleshed out by the government. Um, there is uh, some, so we can talk about general principles, which people will people will be identified as, as in certain groups, for example, having chronic kidney disease or having had a transplant, and they'll be identified and, and contacted. And then um, a, a dose, uh, a time and, and sort of place for dose will be um, alerted to them. Um, some of that can be done in an electronic way, but people that aren't quite so savvy or don't prefer that way, there'll be another way to, to, to achieve that, that same outcome. So look, the actual specifics of that haven't been, um, haven't been told to us, but should, should come in time. Thanks, Peter. I'd want to follow up on that very quickly because there's another excellent question. I've been asked this in my clinic by my patients too. Um, if I decide to skip my turn and not take advantage of being in group 1B, then can I opt in to receive a vaccine at a later date? What's the position there? So the... the um... Uh, the, the scheme that's been um, uh, show, shown to us by the government and advice we have from some uh, COVID task force work, workers at the federal level is that while they'll initially start with, let's say, phase 1A, there'll be some crossover as they, they don't necessarily capture everyone in 1A and then they move to 1B and then move to, move to other phases and so on. So I think the impression that we get is that people will have won't all be captured at one time in a certain group and we'll have an opportunity to be vaccinated later. Um, but I would, look, I, I would, I suppose I would stress that as, as the time comes up to be vaccinated, I, I would take that, that opportunity. I wouldn't, I don't think you, you wouldn't be advised to, uh, you know, wait for some different vaccine or something in future that there's no, there's no uh, real certainty about what's happening in the future. And I think, as I say, the, the, to some degree, you've got to trust that the people advising government uh, are, are experts in, in immunisation and they are, they are taking, um, uh, making decisions in your best health in, for, your, for your best protection at, at any thank, one time. 
Thanks, Peter. I want to cut you off there because there are two last questions I want to get in before Holly closes uh, uh, our, se our session. And the first one is quickly to Steve. Um, a good question here about resuming, resuming normality, which of course is what we all want. Um, will I need proof of vaccination to start to attend my regular transplant clinics or to go out socially or to travel interstate or overseas? Steve, um, what's the, the go there? We don't believe that you will require proof that you'd have vaccination to do any of those things with the potential exception for international travel. Um, there has been some talk of requirement by other countries or indeed air carriers. Within Australia, you, you won't need proof. But I'd have to say, Toby, that I think you can step out with more confidence if you've been immunised. We should get immunised. Absolutely. I completely agree. And finally, Libby, um, with vaccination, can I dispense with all those safety precautions, including masks and washing my hands? What's the answer there? No, no, you cannot. <laughs> Sorry. Um, that's the short answer. COVID's um, here with us for a, a while longer and um, vaccination doesn't mean automatic immunity. Um, and so we know that the vaccine in this percentage um, isn't effective. So we, and we won't know that definitely if someone is vaccinated. So still the risk of A, um, getting the infection, or B, you could be an in, um, an, have an asymptomatic infection and you could actually be what they can call an asymptomatic spreader yourself. So um, we all still need to take those precautions to protect not only ourselves, but other people as well, despite having been vaccinated. Thanks. Thanks, Libby. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Transplant Australia. Um, I just want to pass back to Holly uh, to, to close our session. Thanks, Toby, and thank you very much, Libby, Steve, and Peter, for your contributions tonight. And once again, thank you, Richard, Maddie, and Kim. As a recipient myself, in a situation that is constantly evolving and information is continually being learned, uh, I feel comforted, uh, and um, I found the information incredibly insightful and reassuring. And it's really, as studies around the world continue to proceed uh, our evidence base and understanding of the virus and the vaccines impact will continue to grow and at transplant australia we are committed to making sure that we can help our transplant recipients and the wider transplant community uh, to understand this information and so we're really pleased with the turnout today it's been fantastic and we would like to uh, reiterate that the message uh, from tonight was clear. Transplant Australia supports vaccination and we encourage everyone to check with their treating physician to, and organise to get vaccinated when it's rolled out. The sooner we do, the sooner we can get somewhat towards the, the life that we would like it to be. Transplant Australia is here to help those uh, touched by transplantation, whether you are waiting, a recipient, a living donor or donor, donor family. And we would encourage you to check our website, transplant.org.au for more information. Uh, as it becomes available. We also encourage you to join our community through our free membership and we can so that we can continue to stay in touch. We hope that we've answered as many questions as possible. We appreciate there's still some that may be out there. As we've said before, any specific questions um, for your own personal circumstances, please check with your doctor or your transplant unit. Uh, but thank you very much for joining us. We've had a fantastic evening. This presentation will be available on the website shortly um, and we hope you stay safe and have a good evening. Thank you.